method meets all the requirements of the 2012 IBC code and is indeed contained in several chapters of the uh, new ASCE 7-10 standard. So what I'm going to talk about with this method here, uh, I'm going to start out in the first session talking about some basic concepts of wind engineering just to get everybody on the same page. And then I want to go through the background of how this particular simplified method uh, was developed. I always believe that uh, before one uses a design aid, they, they should know uh, how it was developed and where it came from. So I'm going to cover that. And then we're going to talk about uh, some of the details of the method, what is and is not covered. And then we'll close in the third session with an example problem to demonstrate how the method is applied from the tables in the, in the standard. So one of the things that we've discussed at some length on our code committee is that we recognize that the codes in general have become very complex. Uh, they're not very user friendly in many cases, and they change way too often. Uh, I can tell you on the wind committee that we, we have heard those arguments, and that certainly was the motivation for developing this simplified approach. When I started practice, uh, I used the 1976 UBC, which uh, actually was a much simpler approach to the design of buildings for wind loads uh, than what we have uh, today. There was a wind map, and then there was a table, and you actually pulled your wind pressures right out of a table, depending on the uh, particular wind velocity that you had in your particular area of the country. So what we're trying to do here is return to the good old days and develop something that you can use as a simple design aid without having to develop uh, your own spreadsheet and without having to go through all the equations are part of the wind standard. The particular method I'm going to talk about <coughs> is uh, the it covers both main wind force resisting system and components and cladding. Uh, chapter 27, uh, part 2, talks about this method for the main wind force system. And then the component and cladding portion is covered in chapter 30, part 4. So let's dive into some of the basic concepts of uh, wind engineering and wind pressure. <clears throat> I always like to start out talks on wind load to make a comparison between how we design a building for wind loads versus how we design a building for seismic loads. And this particular slide is a plot of lateral load versus building displacement or drift. And you can see that we start out at uh, the origin and the building essentially responds in a linear fashion as you apply the load. And even under the ultimate wind load, which now in the ASCE 710 standard is defined as a 700-year mean recurrence interval wind load for Category 2 buildings, even under this ultimate wind load with a load factor of 1, we expect the building to perform no higher than that red dot there, and that is it stays essentially elastic. We do not expect, <clears throat> even under this maximum wind load, for the building to respond in the inelastic range. Now let's contrast that with seismic design and the philosophy used in seismic design. In seismic design, because of the magnitude of the seismic loads that are imparted to a building, we recognize that we cannot afford to design the building to respond in, typically in the elastic range only. So what we do is we pretend the building responds elastically up to V sub E there. And then we divide that elastic response by a, an R factor. And then we essentially proportion the building as if it was responding in the first significant yield range. But in reality, I think it's, <clears throat> it's, it's very important to understand that in reality, the building is responding inelastically under the design earthquake. And the reason we can get away with an inelastic performance is we, we understand that we have to build ductility into the lateral load system and particularly the connections. 
So totally different philosophy between wind load design, where we keep the building essentially elastic, and seismic design, where we recognize the building is going to behave in the inelastic range of response. 